Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. ESCOM has moved to overhaul the project labour agreement at the strike-prone Madupi site. Terence Creamer joins me to talk about why. Hi Terence. The intervention related to the project labour agreement follows on several incidents of labour unrest at the site. Why does ESCOM believe a new framework will restore peace and stability? Well, I think, uh, as you say, there have been really a lot of labour actions on that site uh, over the years since um, the project got going back in 2006, 2007. There's been sporadic events, some of sometimes, oftentimes, violent events on that site, and the site gets closed. And earlier this year, after the December break, there was a particularly protracted period of 10 weeks where Labour refused to come back to site. And it seems like <coughs> what of one of the major complaints is around the, the project Labour agreement that is in place for the contractors on site, and that these are not really being applied consistently across all the different contractors. So there's, I think there's 39 or 35 contract packages across the site and uh, the various um, organisations that employ the labour on the site, it's not Eskom Labour, you know, they fall, all fall under the PLA, but they're not consistently applied. So I think Eskom is wanting to be a bit more proactive in the relationship because it's become a major risk. Uh, it's vulnerable. This project's already vulnerable to a number of shifts in its deadlines. Mostly, I think, initially was related to um, the lack of planning around the project and the lack of skills and there was also a financing issue. So there was a number of issues that made the project vulnerable to delay. And we've seen a number of shifting uh, deadlines over the years. But the more recent delays, I think, although we've got the welding issues and we've got the um, control instrumentation issues on site, they, they bec the labor issues become, I think, the biggest threat to the timeline. So the, the, what is going to happen now is they're going to have a, a, a more generalized framework which Eskom uh, participates in. They're going to re renegotiate basically the labor agreements for the site. They've given themselves till the end of May, so that's labor, the contractors and Eskom. And Eskom is going to be integral to that process. And apparently labor specialist the, uh, uh, Charles Newpin has been called in to help facilitate that negotiation. And we understand that, that during this period of negotiation, there will be an amnesty in terms of industrial actions on the site. So the unions have agreed that they won't be taking uh, assertive actions during the period of the negotiation. But <laughs> that doesn't apply to some of the other construction sites that Eskom is active on. So we have Kusile in the Mpumalanga province and uh, we have the Ngula site in KwaZulu-Natal. And already Kusile this week, we saw workers, a number of workers went off site and are unhappy. And obviously, these are the same unions. These are National Union of Mine Workers workers, and these are NUMSA workers, National Union of Metal Workers. Uh, so they, the communication lines are open, and they seeing they have visibility of what's happening at Madupi. And uh, I think they, they would like a similar arrangement um, pu put in place um, at Kusile. And um, I'm, not, I'm not as clear at Angula, but it seems that the, by the end of May, Kusile, Angula and Madupi should have this new framework for labor relations. <coughs> and really it's about more standardization, having um, Eskom much more hands-on in the labor, uh, the labor disputes and grievances. So there's a coming together of minds around you know, the need to sustain these deadlines uh, at the site. And also there's, there's talk of changing the incentive structure because productivity is the big issue now on these sites and looking at uh, having incentives that really talk to workers' needs and get the workers excited about meeting these uh, deadlines and milestones. The changes to the labour agreement formed part of a broader commitment to the Madupi schedule. That's correct. You know, we, there was a, it was a major high-level site tour that uh, media was privy to yesterday. It was, the media was there, and, uh, but it was really uh, a show of force from Eskom and from its shareholder, uh, Minister Malusi Gigabe in particular, to say that we will not tolerate as South Africa any more delays to the schedule at Madupi. And uh, we were supposed to have meetings a lot earlier in the day than eventually we did have because there was a fairly protracted meeting with the contractors and labour on the site where the message was put across quite clearly. There were high level labour representatives there, there were top level executives from Hitachi and Alstom. At, uh, at the site, taking the tour with the minister. 
there was just about the whole, I don't think the whole board, but a good uh, portion of the Eskom board was there, including the chairperson, um, Zora Tsotsi. We had the CEO, Brian Dams, leading the tour along with uh, the minister. And we had, um, you know, uh, uh, FD Poa Flaherty, who's a key figure at uh, trying to get this uh, project moving. He is outgoing FD, but uh, there's, uh, he's been very instrumental in getting sort of a direct executive link from Megawatt Park onto that Madupi site. And there is now some talk about the finance director who has resigned from July, maybe staying on in some sort of capacity for another year or so, just to oversee the, uh, the commissioning, the hot commissioning of Unit 6, as well as Unit 5 at Madupi. Those are the first two units that will be synchronized to the grid. And that will take place. You know, the, there was a commitment and a, you know, a firm line put in the sand by Minister Gavaba that, we'll, that there's going to be no shifting beyond the December 2013 uh, target date for first synchronization to the grid. Um, and so uh, it seems that there's going to be a, a lot of interventions, both from the shareholder who's saying that uh, the minister himself is going to play an active role in creating visibility on the site, taking up regular visits. In fact, he was very instrumental in getting the workers back to site after that 10 week break in, in January, February and March. So he, there's that sort of level of intervention. There's a board subcommittee that's been set up to oversee the capital program and to really monitor it a bit more closely. And then there's this executive link from Megawatt Park on the ground. And uh, everyone yesterday, Eskom, the minister in particular, Alstom and Itachi made it very clear that they are going to do everything in their powers and capacity to, um, to get the, the first units, Unit 6, uh, onto the grid by December. And then obviously there'll be a ramp up phase so that we get up to that 800 megawatts, which we, we desperately, desperately need. But the message was that this is a, a very important flagship project for the government uh, and the Presidential Infrastructure Coordinating Commi Commission. And there's reputational damage happening around the site because of the the technical issues, the welding and the control instrumentation, which both Alstom and Itachi, I think, made it quite clear they have plans for resolving. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see because it's not just resolving them before the commissioning. Then there's also the integration of the plant when it actually ramps up and when it starts burning the coal. And so there's a, there's a, there is some way to go, that, and that's going to be tight and difficult to meet that. But I think particularly the getting everyone on the same page, you know, labor, contractors and ESCOM to say, that we need to meet these uh, these deadlines from a country inc perspective and we can't have any more shifting of these deadlines so i think we are in a new phase around madupi there is a, a a very strong spotlight now on the project and i think we're going to have sort of a regular visibility of what's happening there do you think ESCOM will be able to reach these timelines and what are the possible cost implications well that's a very uh, important question i think they made a uh, also quite apparent uh, yesterday that there are cost implications for trying to do this catch-up because we've lost all this time and there have been, they've been issues on all sides, not just the contractor side, on the Eskom side, on the planning side. There have been always these, these niggling issues around the Madupi project and a, a big lesson was that you, know, you can't enter into these mega projects without really good planning and having your processes in, in place well ahead. But the, the cost overrun visibility we don't have yet, and I suppose that will emerge over the next few months. You know, Eskom's finished its financial year, so that I think that the finance people will be running the numbers, looking at what the implications are. Obviously, you know, uh, there the are contract, um, contracts in place and there are dispute resolutions and there's remedies for clawing back. If Eskom feels that a contractor has let it down, they are able to claw back. It's not clear how aggressive they're going to be in that area. I think the main focus is really to get uh, the project up and running. You don't want to have an adversarial climate uh, all the time around claims, but they made it <laughs> quite clear, both the minister and Eskom, that they will pursue their rights. And the uh, minister in particular is saying there will be penalties for those that have led to these delays. But the cost implications are not, uh, not fully uh, available to, to all of us at the moment. And there are cost implications of this catch-up program. So it's going to be interesting. And then technically, your, your second part of your question, can, can Eskom do it? Can the contractors do it? Well, there's this commitment, commitment, and this commitment is in writing from very serious organizations. You know, Hitachi and Alstom are, are major organizations in their own right. 
and they don't, I think, lightly put thing pen to paper to say that we can definitely meet a schedule. So they have put those uh, put those commitments out there. Now it's about managing uh, those commitments and particularly, I think, managing the labour relations on that site so that we can get to that target date of December 2013 without too, too many more hitches. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.